Reynolds and I would like to welcome you to the 10th programme in our Best Games series. We've reached 1970, the modern game, and our first look at a modern genius, the mild-mannered Russian Boris Spassky. Spassky was born in Leningrad, where as a child he studied chess for five hours every day in the Palace of Young Pioneers. He won the Soviet Junior Championship in 1955 and the Soviet Championship in 1961. He first challenged the wily Armenian Tigran Petrosian, unsuccessfully as it turned out, in the World Championship in 1966. But he sought out Petrosian three years later in Moscow, where he won the world title by 12 and a half games to 10 and a half. At the zenith of his powers, Spassky's play was glittering and elegant. He was regarded as the universal player who could handle any type of position with insight and supreme grasp of technique. In the following game from 1970, Spassky led the USSR team in their conquest of the world in Belgrade. Bill was the match of the century. It was against Danish grandmaster Bent Larsen. Larsen was one of the first modern Western grandmasters to pose a serious challenge for Soviet domination of the international circuit in the 1960s. His outstanding result as top ball for the Danish Olympic team in 1956 had persuaded him to give up his studies as a civil engineer and to become a professional chess player, qualifying as the candidate for the world championship four times. Larsen had played in the same tournament as Spassky back in 1958 as young students of great promise. Larsen's results were consistently impressive and in Belgrade, he played ball one for the world against Spassky, ball one for the USSR. Now, Ray, talking of Boris Spassky, uh, I happened to be in Oslo some years ago and in search of some reading material and uh, came across this very interesting book, Korchnoi versus Spassky by Raymond Keane. Mm -hmm. And um, brought it up to my hotel room and, and was profoundly moved to see that it's dedicated to me. So I've always wanted a chance to thank you publicly and to get it autographed by you. My pleasure. <laughs> Let me do it now. <laughs> that has to be a first of one kind or another. Not only coming across it in those circumstances, but being able to get it autographed publicly. So what made you buy a book on Spassky? Are you a particular devotee of Spassky's games? Well, uh, there were several reasons, actually. One is, uh, A, you don't get an awful lot of it, books in English in, in Norway. Mm -hmm. um, B, I'd had dinner with Korchnoi that evening. His opponent in the yes. match. Victor Livovich, who mm -hmm. you know well. And, um, you know, also I like, I like uh, the play of, I think, Spassky and Korchnoi, both great players. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I thought Spassky was very gracious in his matches with uh, Fischer, you know, when you consider what he had to put He's it up. He's a good with. loser. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> he certainly is. But in this game... Well, one final reason is having met you in Cape Town. Oh, yes. <laughs> So let's turn to today's game and Larson playing white, Spassky black yeah. in the USSR world match, an historic occasion. And Larson played this really unexpected move. It's got to be extremely unusual, right? Surely. Certainly is. I mean, in all the games we've seen so far, white's always kicked off with E4 or more frequently D4 or the English opening C4. And now here's Larson in a really key game playing a move that's quite out of the ordinary. But Larson actually became an expert in this rather unusual opening. And it's now called Larson's Opening. I mean, when he, when he played it against Spassky, he hadn't quite fathomed out all the complexities. But uh, in coming games, he found nuances yeah. and niceties, and he elaborated the strategic ideas and actually turned it into quite a fearsome weapon. And Spassky, as one would expect, played a vigorous classical response he put a pawn bang in the centre of the board. And Larson attacked it. And Spassky <coughs> brought out his knight to c6 to defend the pawn. Now, if White's opening has a point, and of course it does have a point, the point must be to batter a path for the White Bishop on b2 
through the centre and try to erode the black pawn on e5. In that increase. sense, would, would it be too fanciful to say it's a kind of queenside reti? Yes, it is a kind yeah. of queenside reti opening with the fianchetto of the queen's bishop. And White's strategy has to be to hit the black pawn on e5, to make it move out of the way or somehow capture it, sidestep it, to force it to move, to increase the power of the bishop on b2. If black can set up a blockade in the path of that bishop, the piece becomes useless and it defeats the whole object of the opening. Now, the right way to do this to continue the undermining process is to play this move. And the point being, white then follows up by putting the bishop on b5, which is attacking the defender of the e5 pawn. And then moves like this can follow. The knight can come to e2, and white can play f4. And all this is in the interest of blasting a path for the queen's bishop. This is a very reasonable way for white to play the opening. But Larson didn't do that. And in later games, he realized that this was, in fact, the right way to play the position. But here, in the early days against Spassky, when he hadn't sorted out all the tricks in the opening, he played this move, which is a kind of Sicilian defense with colors reversed. And this is really a bad move. And already, white is failing to implement the key strategic ideas of the opening. And in fact, he's blocking the path of his king's bishop. He's actually playing a Sicilian defense a it's, tempo it's a up. bad move for what reason? It, it locks in the bishop on f1. And if, if, uh, if black were to oblige and immediately play a move like, like d5 yeah. and offer a proper transposition yes. to a reverse Sicilian, then it wouldn't be so bad. But black doesn't need to do that. And the pawn on c4 doesn't really help the white position at all. And uh, Spassky simply brought out the other knight. And now Larson really compounded the error of the previous move by playing much too provocatively. He brought out his knight to f3. And again, I would say that, let's put the knight back for a minute, that the safe way to play here would be either to develop the knight here to c3, looking at the d5 square, perhaps later on developing the other bishop on the flank to control d5. That's one way to play. Another sensible way to play would be to play pawn to e3, and then perhaps the pawn to d3, and then bring out the knight. There's nothing wrong with this. It's kind of passive, but it's not bad. But Larson did none of these things. Larson's noted as a provocative player. He likes to tempt his opponents to encourage them to attack him and the hopes to beat off the attack. And he played this move. Now, in a sense, it fulfills the strategic idea I mentioned of making the black e-pawn move forwards to clear a path for the white bishop. But it's taking on too many obligations. And the pawn did, in fact, move forwards, hitting the knight fairly vigorously. And the knight's got to move. And there's really no very good square for it. And it could go to g5, for example but black would just hit it with h6 and start chasing the knight all over the board. Well, back to square one. Yeah, back to square one. <laughs> that wouldn't be any good at all. Um, he could put the knight in on e5, and black would trade it off. But again, white's piece would be wandering around rather homeless in the middle of the board. He could put it out here on the edge. But again, it's not a very good square at all. And it would be a dreadful struggle getting the, the piece back into the game again. And if his knight is on, uh, let's see, is d5, e5, mm -hmm. um, then what does he do if that uh, queen's pawn nudges up there? You mean if he plays this move? Yes. yes. What black would do in this case would be to take the knight off, and white would have to take back again with the bishop, and then black would play this, as you so rightly yes. say, moving the queen's pawn, chasing the bishop again, and black gets a big lead in development. So none of this happened. And what Larson, in fact, did was he put his knight in the middle. It's the, it's the best of a bad choice at the moment. But even here, the knight can be kicked around some more. And what Spassky did, very simply, bishop c5. And this reminds me in a curious sort of way. Many weeks back, we looked at the game Pauls and Morphy, yes. number two in the series. And you remember that there, 
Morphy, in the interest of a quick development, didn't mind having his pawns doubled. Yes. And he also played the move bishop to c5 in the opening, which is a very aggressive move looking at the white king. And now Larsen really hasn't got much choice. His knight's attacked again. So he could, e3. He could play e3, mm -hmm. but it's, it leaves a bad hole on the d3 square. And black might even immediately play a knight into e5. Mm, getting very ugly. Yes. yes. Or, that's one possibility. Another possibility would simply be to, to take this off, say, with the bishop doubling white's pawns. And then if white takes back with the pawn, to take over the whole centre of the ball like this. It's a very nasty position yes. for white. Put the pieces back. And the other possibility after e3, bishop takes d4, is to take with the bishop. But then again, he would take off. He'd take back and play d5. And the white doubled pawns yes. in the middle are a dreadful mess. And white's almost losing this position already. It's a horrible position to get. So Larson's already faced with a dilemma in this position. I mean, he could do this, which is dreadfully passive and retrograde, but he decided that he would accept the challenge and double the black pawns. So he took the black knight. And just like Morphy did, Spassky takes back. Away from Away the centre. Yeah. Yes, it's breaking one of the little rules, but the it's better, in theory, to I'm have the pawns dangerous habits, yeah. bunched into it's the centre. It's going to get me into a lot of trouble yeah. at the club. <laughs> but here, the fact that black has such a free development immediately, pressure in the open d-file from the queen, the ability to bring this bishop out very quickly, all this adds up to more than adequate compensation for the double pawns. And again, there are so many similarities here with the Morphy game, the doubling of the pawns, the black bishop on the c-file right. square, yes. the free scope of the black pieces, the black queen coming in the d-file. And White has to be very careful now. now. Of course, Larson's an eternal optimist. And what he probably thought was our double pawns, I'll win the endgame, which is really where double pawns become at their, at their most weak and useless. But first of all, he has to get his pieces out. As Dr. Tarish said, before the endgame, the gods have annoyingly placed the middle game. Then Larson did this. It's a sensible move. And out comes the bishop. So you can see that black's really got a very fluid and pleasant development here. Queen comes here. I think what Larson's trying to do, actually, is he's trying to castle on the queen's side to get his king away from these rather dangerous-looking black pieces on the right-hand side. But Spassky's got the same idea. He also plays his queen out to e7. And Larson plays this. Bishop to e2, good developing move. And now Spassky connects the rooks. I think Larson's changing his mind castle-wise. Well, we never find out, because he, <laughs> he, he doesn't get to castle. So black castles queen, so now the rook's in a very aggressive position. And Larson chooses this moment to play a quite <coughs> interesting move. He plays pawn to f4. And his idea is that black can't take that en passant, because the queen will take the bishop with yes. check. So he can't, he can't play this move, because the bishop on f5 is hanging. And what Larson's trying to do is to barricade the king's side in preparation for a move like this, yes. followed by castling queenside. Yes. And I think many lesser players than Spassky would have been able, unable to exploit this. They would have allowed Larson's strategy to triumph. But what Spassky does now is really tremendous. He just launches a devastating attack that based on some very, very subtle points. And it starts off with this move. Knight to g4. And one of the threats here is to play the queen ah, out to yeah. h4, check. <clears throat> Which, of course, Larson stops. And from now on, we all know Larson's plan is to play knight c3, and castle queen queenside side, and setting. Yeah. The whole focus of the battle shifts entirely to the right-hand side of the board. There's absolutely nothing that he can do to stop all the action taking place on the right-hand side where the black pieces have concentrated. 
and Spassky kicks off, starts the attack with this move, pawn to h5. And the clear intention is to ram this pawn forwards and just try to blast a hole yeah. in the white position. I'm sure Larson had foreseen this and wasn't worried. And what he plays is this, pawn to h3, attacking the knight. Now, Donald, what would you do if you were black in this position? Let's say you had this game in a Serbit and club match. I would get the knight back, wouldn't I? <laughs> get him right out of the area. That would be the normal reaction. Yes. And there are two ways to bring them up. One is, is yeah. knight to h6, which actually isn't very good. Oh, uh, f6 white. I'd go for, yes. right? Yes, in that particular case, the bishop would take the pawn on g7. And uh, that would really throw a spanner in the works from Black's point of view. Got to come to f6. Yes. So the natural move, of course, is to put the knight back onto f6. Yes, and you're going to tell me that that's not what he did. It's not what he did. No. Most people. That's why do he that. doesn't play for Serbit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember that I was I was in the west of England in 1970 when this game was being played. I, I was preparing for an international team tournament with an English uh, player called Peter Clark, and we were getting the moves uh, uh, of the games from Belgrade from this great USSR World match in uh, in Russian newspapers, and we got the moves of this game. And we simply could not believe what Spassky did now. And even after we'd seen it happen, we couldn't believe it. He leaves the knight where it is, and he pushes on this pawn. Fantastic move. Now, of course, white can't take the pawn, and that would be immediately suicidal, yeah. because the black queen would come raging in, and that would be the end That's of the game immediately. The back, yes. But the position's become so threatening now that White must take the bait. He must take the knight. So he plays it. H takes g4. Maybe Larson even foresaw this and still thought he was OK. Spassky takes this. So now he's given up a piece, but he has a, a dangerous-looking pass pawn on g3. Yes. And if White would say now to, to trade the rooks, Say rook takes h8. No harm done. And rook takes back. Then, of course, white would be in a dreadful mess yes. because the rook is going to come into the white position. The rook is going to penetrate to the square, for example, yeah. with an absolutely deadly attack. It doesn't need a genius to see that this is yeah. going to be decisive. And the rook combined with the pawn on g3 would finish the game very quickly. But this didn't happen. Of course, Larson's much too good a defensive player to fall for that. And I suspect he'd seen the sacrifice, and he'd planned... And he's been cursing his knight back there. <laughs> this one that stops him queenside. Yes, he still can't castle queenside, but I think he thought he had a defence on the kingside. He played rook g1. And this looks like a defence, because he's now eyeing the black pawn on g3. There's no obvious attack for black in the, in the h-file. The bishop on f5 is attacked. And within, given, given a, a move, knight to c3, white can castle. Yeah. He's safe in a piece up. And this is where we get the most fantastic move from Spassky, this unbelievable move, which you know, just shot me completely when I first saw it, and it's still hard to grasp. Now, I showed you the variation where the rook yes. was it traded, and then black invaded with his own rook. What Spassky did was, he did it anyway. He played rook to h1. <laughs> <He's kind> of... <coughs> yes. Just putting the rook where it can be taken. Yes, at first sight, it doesn't seem horribly threatening. Until you start looking at the implications. Yeah, but just giving up a rook like this. White has no choice. The gun, the pistol's at his head. He must take it. Rook takes h1. Just and now, can I ask a question there, Ray? Possibly. Why doesn't he um, simply move his king over? He moves the king over yes. like this. Then black is bringing in the queen. I... Which is devastating. Yes. 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 And you'll see variations yes. like this occurring in the game. So white must take the rook, rook takes. The pawn comes on to g2, gaining the vital yeah. move, the vital move that's needed. So he's got to come back. Then. Yes, and then when the rook comes here, for yeah. example, black is giving check. Oh. Oh my good god, as Arthur Daly would say. King is here. <laughs> and the queen is coming in here, yes. which is absolutely decisive. 
So we go back to the game position. What Larson actually played was rook to here. The queen came in, check. King went away. Oh, and now he took this check, and the game's over. White resigned in this position. He has to take back. Bishop takes f1. And now it's checkmate very quickly. Bishop takes pawn, check. Bishop e2. And then queen here, checkmate. An incredible game. So it was that rook sacrifice that yes, really... Yes, it's the rook sacrifice that did it. It's quite amazing. Much. Yes, it is. Absolutely incredible. amazing. I've never seen a rook sacrifice like that before. But you know, it's, it's, with, it's like genius in, in all spheres. When, when you're able to look at it deliberately, chew it over afterwards, you think, oh, brilliant. But that someone could have foreseen that then, in the heat of play, mm -hmm. in, with all the tension. Uh, it's a masterpiece, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We were talking about Spassky and Korchnoi before, before the game started. Mm -hmm. And I remember that that korchnoi spassky match that you showed me the book of, they were playing in separate cubicles, separate rooms there. Mm. And this is you know, a remarkable way to play chess. Have you ever played I've, I've, I once had a, a weird uh, chess experience. You know, I was banned in South Africa, and um, as a newspaper editor, it meant I couldn't write anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but the security police were briefing me on what I couldn't do. I couldn't be in a room with more than one person, etc. Mm. And I said, you know, I'm captain of the chess club, and are you telling me I can't go and play chess? And they said, of course not. You can't uh, go into a chess club where there's all, a whole lot of other chess players. And having thought of this, I said, but you remember, you know, the famous players, Bobby Fischer, Spassky and the others, have played in a room on their own. Mm -hmm. I said, I will arrange to play against only one other player. Mm -hmm. And so he, the Colonel von Amerwa, thumbed through all his <laughs> regulations, and he said, well, I can't see anything against that, but you'll have to be alone with one other player. So I said, right. Then he suddenly said, but you mustn't drink tea or coffee while you're playing. No, no tea or coffee. And I, you know, it sounded so crazy. Mm. I said, but why? He said, well, the purpose of banding is to prevent a common social purpose with other people. And even if you're in a separate room, the other members of the chess club will be drinking tea or coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was so crazy. I remember saying to him, uh, well, if I have Coke, would that be all right? Mm. And he just got angry. <laughs> <laughs> but you managed to end up playing chess in the separate room. Well, I, I did it twice, you know, but it, it, it was actually so uh, tense, the whole, these poor chaps, the other members, they didn't mm. know if they were being watched by the police. So I ended up playing at home. At I used home. to come up to the house and play me one at a time. Donald, that's a wonderful story. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed. So there we've seen Spassky at his imaginative best, but of course his greatest challenge still lay ahead. In 1972, his challenger for the world title was a brash, unschooled genius from Brooklyn, Bobby Fischer. The two of them had met in the 1966 Olympiad, and their clash of style and temperament was to produce the most memorable headline news in the history of the World Championship. The world's media gathered in Reykjavik in Iceland, but the start of play was constantly delayed. First, by Fischer's late arrival from America. Then, with Spassky ready and all the preparations made, by Fischer's late arrival for the first game. Fischer Spassky, 1972, has become a landmark in chess. Join us next week for that special confrontation. From Donald and me and Thames's chess team, goodbye for now.